Ryan Reese. This is Live with Ryan Reese. Call now, 1-888-564-6173. Or post your questions using the hashtag LiveRyanReese on his Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. All right, tonight is going to be a sick show. I have Sean McKeon in studio. Obviously, you guys know he's been the co-host for the last couple years on this show. But he's always talked a little bit about his story, but we've never sat down and grinded through and heard his whole story, how he got saved. So tonight is a very special night. Not only that, it's his birthday weekend. Yep. I turned 41 yesterday. You are old, really I f- old. I feel like I'm 25. I feel <laughs> great. Yes. But hey, isn't it interesting getting uh, into your 40s? I never thought I'd see my 40s. I, yeah. I don't know about you, but I never thought I'd see my 40s. But yeah, now they're just flying by. And when you say that, that means you thought you'd be dead in your 20s. That's what I thought for sure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Me too. I told, used to tell my mom, you know, mom, I, I'll be lucky if I make it to 24. That's how I felt too. Yeah, I mean, it's crazy. All, all, my, all of my time growing up. For crazy, sure. crazy. So it's going to be sick, man. So stay tuned in for sure. We're going to talk about a story of wildness to finding God and all the rad things he's been doing in his life since that point. But I do want to address something before we get into his story. You know, we always talk about suicide and depression on the show. And the reason why we talk about this, because as we toured the high schools with the Kill the Noise tour, which we've hit 60 schools so far, and we're continuing. I think another 150 schools just opened up for middle schools and high schools. Um, so this tour is not stopping by any means. But what's interesting is that the Time Magazine is saying that there's an epidemic with suicide and depression right now. And that came out a couple months ago. And then just an, an article just recently came out in Arizona. Um, uh, what is it? It says, uh, what is it? January 31st, it says... The headline says, Senate bill address suicide crisis among school children in Arizona. The article goes on to say, the number of people taking their own lives in Arizona is on the rise. In 2017, Arizona ranked number 12 in the nation for the number of suicides with more than 13,000 across the state. Wow. Last year, 13,000 people committed suicide in Arizona. And that's number 12 in the nation. I want to find out the numbers for the number one state and how many numbers, how many people are committing suicide. This is crazy. Then the article goes on to say, more than four times as many people die by suicide than by homicide, and more people died by overdose. The youngest, um, wait, died by suicide in Arizona last year than, okay, let me read that over. Mm -hmm. More than four times as many people die by suicide than by homicide, and more people died by suicide in Arizona last year than by opiate overdose. The youngest person to die by suicide in Arizona was nine years old. Oh, that's horrible. Dude, crazy. So there is this huge epidemic right now that's going on yep. in the world. And like you said, going to all the, the high schools and even now you know, junior highs are opening up as well. And people are battling with so many things. I was sharing at a junior high school the other day, too, the same thing that you talk about all the time. Um, Pornography. Uh, Kids battling with pornography. Uh, Kids battling with um, sexuality as far as bisexual, uh, homosexual. Mm -hmm. um, Transgender. All that stuff that's there. It's a lot of confusion. Depression was major. Uh, They had all these kids write in a bunch of questions that I could answer the next day I came back. And I would say probably 30, 40% had to do with that anxiety, depression. These are young kids. And so there is definitely this pressure that these kids are facing. Uh, The enemy is discouraging a lot of kids as well. Um, And so we do need to pray. You need to continue to pray for the Kill the Noise Tour. God's been doing amazing things. If you follow Ryan's social media feed, uh, you just see these kids coming out in numbers. I was talking with this guy at the gym today uh, who's a believer as well, and I was showing, I was going through the feed, the Whosoever feed, just showing him all the different places from Mexico and San Diego and everything. They were tripping out because um, there's a great need. And the people are, like you say often, are open for the gospel for sure. They are totally open. It's so interesting, like you were saying about the transgender and the homosexual and all all the different sexualities. You know, I recently came across a non-gender. So I had to refer to it. She was a girl that she, I said, well, what do you go by? She goes, I'm non-gender. 
She's neither a boy or a girl, she says. At one of the high schools? Yeah. So I go, well, how do I, so how do I dress you? And you, you, she says, them, them. So not her or he, them. So I got to pray for them. That's pretty crazy. Yeah. So pretty, uh, it's, dude, it's very interesting times these days no, in, yeah. in the high school and, and middle school. Yeah. It is, it is wild. If you want to know where to reach the kids, go to the high schools and middle schools. Yeah. You don't have to go to Hollywood. <laughs> you just go no, right no, to the school for system. Sure. For sure. Wherever you're at in the world. All right, Sean. So let's do this. Are you ready? I'm ready. You're 41. You don't even have gray hair. I don't have gray hair, but I'm losing my hair. Your dad <laughs> reminds me all the time. <laughs> Does he? Yeah. Well, <laughs> when I go look at the camera on this angle, maybe a little <laughs> bit lighter than it used to be. Maybe. Maybe. My dad, always. <laughs> well, look, dude, we, we've known each other for 20, 23 years. Yeah, I, was, I think you're right. About 23 years. Yeah, I think since 92, we uh -huh. met in high school. Mm -hmm. My first time I saw Sean. I got to, okay, let okay, me just tell you for how I met you. Hey, you could be real. Okay, so I'm cruising through school, and <laughs> my friend John Barry goes, hey, man, uh, you got to meet this guy, Sean. I've been hanging out with him, smoking weed in the parking lot. <laughs> I'm like, all right, cool. So I meet Sean. I walk up. I see this guy come from walking, like, I don't know, down down the way by the quad, come just coming across, and this guy was super skinny, <laughs> blonde hair, in the, but it was all shaved on the sides, uh -huh. in the back, yep. and then it was like a ponytail. Uh huh. Did An did Anthony Kiedis have that haircut back then? I think so. I think so. I was trying to be part of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. All I know is you were skinny, pants super sagged, <laughs> like super, six, super Like sagged. almost six foot, probably like 125 <laughs> pounds skinny. That's how skinny I was. Uh, and then a, a tight, short shirt, <laughs> sag pants. Got a long torso. Yeah, long, long, long torso, <laughs> trunken shirt. Uh, this is in the 90s. And uh, hickeys all over your neck, <laughs> just up and down, like, like just like you got just attacked by, by like ten girls, but it was just one. <laughs> like literally, you do that like dark purple. Remember that? Yeah, I remember that. And you're, remember dude, you're like, dude, you're like pasty white too. Like purple. I knew and white. you were gonna bring up that story. <laughs> <laughs> and what's interesting is those hickeys. I don't think they ever left you. <laughs> no, they stayed for a long time. They stayed for a long time. No, those things were on their neck for at least two years. <laughs> so the, anyway, so I was like, oh, man, this guy's sketchy. What's his story? So I go to his house, and we go to a house, you know, where, you know, oh, and, and we go to his house, and but I ended up going with my cousin because he was, became friends with your brother. Right. So I ended up there, and I remember walking in. You were sitting in front of the TV watching, you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers because you idolized them back then, uh -huh. which they're a sick band, and uh, a big old bowl of sal salsa, and you have chips, and you're just – just eating it from Los Cerritos. Uh -huh. And then there was like holes in your guys' walls at your house uh -huh. in your, or in the bedroom. Mm -hmm. And what I realized quickly after that is because you and your brother used to brawl. Raw fight all the time. Dude, you guys were crazy. We were like, <laughs> man, those McKean Irish brothers are psychos. Oh, dude. Throw each other through walls, <laughs> choke each hide, other out. But you guys would hang pictures over to hide from your parents. Oh, dude, we had to move a whole dresser <laughs> in front of the front door like we remodeled the house one time. But, but my just, dad was crazy. You know that. My I dad. was just going to just, you know, paint the picture. Your dad is, a, is an Irish man, <laughs> big, and he'll kill you. And, and you know, we'll, we'll get into those stories later uh, on. Yeah. But you don't mess with his dad. I'm surprised your dad didn't kill you guys. Oh, he came close. Dude. He oh came my close. Gosh, you guys were psycho. We just love crazy. hanging out with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, when I met you guys, I was like, these guys are complete lunatics. Definitely want to be hanging out with these guys. <laughs> and then we all basically all became best friends. So, yeah. that was. That was that. That's it. All right. Well, before we even get to that par part, so, wh hey, where'd you grow up? Did you grow up in Laverne your whole life? or? Yeah, I was born in Highland Park in Panorama City is what, where I was born. Parents moved over to um, Laverne in, when I was about a year. So I grew up there, yeah, my whole life. For those that know. Laverne, you know, California. From California. It's Southern California. Uh, that area is just probably 30 minutes from Los Angeles, 30 minutes from uh, Anaheim. So it's all in this mix. And so, yeah, I just grew up there. My thing as a kid, man, I love sports. I, I dreamed about being an athlete, whether it was a, a football player or a baseball player. That was my thing. Um, and that was something that was like my passion growing up. I could, I memorized all that kind of stuff and yet you definitely had dreams of that, but you know, you know, skinny as a rail that didn't uh, pan out. But you know, one of the big things, Ryan, that, um, but you were good at baseball. I was, I was pretty good at baseball. Now I, I coach baseball with my kids. So it's pretty amazing. Um, 
But when I was a kid, one thing that I battled with a lot, which now as I look back on my life, really affected the rest of my life. What was that? I was sick a lot when I was younger. I had really bad asthma. I was thrown in the hospital multiple times, and it was always around the same time of year. It was February, March kind of time. Um, and I would be in the hospital for about a week or two at a time, multiple oh, wow. times. Um, my asthma was really bad when I was in fifth grade one day, and I still remember the date, March 4th, 1988. I was in fourth or fifth grade, and I was playing basketball outside in front, uh, with my brother, and all of a sudden my vision went out, couldn't see anything. Before I know it, I'm on um, my couch in my living room, paramedics are in my, my, my house. They're asking me who the president is, what year is it? And I kind of remember saying Ronald Reagan and blah, 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 and it was a Friday afternoon, and that's the last thing I remembered. I woke up in a hospital in ICU um, on a Sunday evening. I had a bunch of family that was in my room. I had tubes going through my nose. I had IVs going through my arms. How old are you at this point? I was fourth or fifth grade. So oh, dang, you were young. Yeah, I was young. Um, and I was there for two weeks. I was the only young kid in the hospital surrounded by a bunch of older people, some, you know, about to die. Nobody knew what was taking place with me. I was getting brain scans. They would have to put like those, uh, those tabs on your head trying to see what was going on with your brain. Um, and they couldn't really diagnose. So the final thing was they said they labeled it as migraine headaches. Obviously, and now I, yeah. I deal with migraine headaches. Oh. Um, but I was, I say that because I dealt with sicknesses all the time. I always missed school. I hated school. And so being out of school all the time, you always felt out of the loop. And so I always kind of really struggled in academics all the way from the later part of um, elementary all the way through junior high school. And so when I was trying to find my niche, and if you ever miss for a long period of time, you come back, you feel out of the mix. You do. Yeah. You have your crew. You have your friends. Um, but you're still trying to find yourself. And for me... Um, where I got kind of connected is like, I, I hung out with guys that were like the smart Alex in the class, you know, being in class, I couldn't pay attention to the teacher. I was behind. I was confused what was taking place in class. So that was my path of just hanging out with the guys that are smart Alex all the time, mm -hmm. saying something to the teacher, getting kicked out. And that's what kind of began my, my ride into craziness. Hmm. So... Uh, when you were growing up, like, what was your family life like with your, with your mom and your dad? Yeah, you know, as we go in the story, the you're, you're going to see, like, you know, we battled a bunch of drugs and alcohol. But in my home, man, I was brought up with a good family. My mom is amazing, and she's still around. My, my dad as well. My dad's old school, like you were saying. He's a brawler. He grew up on the projects. Like, you wouldn't well, want to mess with him. What, what, what part? Where did he grow up? Was it New in York L.A.? In the, LA? the part of, like, East L.A. Oh, area he was, like, the back only white in the guy day. in that neighborhood, right? Yeah. Yeah, when he was a kid, for yeah. sure. So he grew up in the hood. Right? So he was he was fighting all the time, and then for us, he was down for us. He would do anything for us. Um, he ha had a temper, obviously, um, and my mom was like a saint. I would say I was brought up in a good home. You know, just a middle class family. Um, my dad drank a little bit, but not not out of control. My mom never touched a drug. Neither my dad never touched a drug in their life. So it had nothing to do with the way I was brought up. They the way that my workers. life went. They were hard workers, hard yeah. Workers. Yeah. And we were very connected. I have two brothers as well, and me and my brothers all had a close relationship as well. So, you know, my home life, I would say, was pretty on point, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't mind being home. I didn't mind spending time with my family when I was younger. Um, but there was always something in me, and that's why I bring up that time of a kind of like that, that, um, that time of sickness because I always felt, even as a young kid alone, even when I had a lot of people around me, mm -hmm. Um, I didn't feel like anybody could connect. We were joking around in the beginning of like, I never thought I would see my 40s or 50s. I really thought that when I was a kid mm -hmm. because I was always in hospital rooms. I was always getting shots. I'm always being talked to a doctor. You know, one thing that my doctor said when I was a kid, he's like, whatever you do when you grow up, don't ever smoke. <laughs> you know, no and obviously I've done so many things other than, uh, yeah. uh, on top of smoking. Oh. Um, but all of that left me kind of finding who I was. And I, that's why I think I was an open target for going down a pathway of destruction. And, you know, everything I'm talking about right now, probably that that a lifestyle of, like, trying to find yourself, kind of being a class clown a little bit, struggling with academics, was all the way from the elementary, all the way through junior high, and then going into high school is when I started to really start to get caught up. So when I met you, you were already dating a girl. So what, 
Yeah. When did you did you meet her in high school? Yeah. So when I was um, a freshman and freshman in high school, just like everybody, play football. But once you stop, you know, making grades, you get cut from the team. Mm -hmm. And so stop doing doing sports, athletics, which I, which I love. And then the girl came, you know. And yeah, I was starting to talk to her. She lived right down the street from me, and we started a, a relationship back then. And that was the one, like you have little like, you know, girlfriends when you're a kid or whatever. But no, but this was a big serious. one. This was like the no, one. No, this was like, yeah, real. This is where all the experiences took place in my life when it came to sexuality and everything. You know, I was 14 years old and we started that relationship and it went really fast, you know. And, you know, at that time when it comes to like pornography and everything, I had already seen consumed part. I know you talked about seeing pornography when you were young, like in second grade. I don't think I was that young. I think it was more like in junior high. Where'd you see it? Um, uh, I broke into my bro older brother's room, and me and my brother found a bunch of stuff at one point. You will point. always find pornography in your Ex older brother's room. Ex exactly. <laughs> and then um, my cousin's house, my cousin's house back in yeah. the day, always had a bunch of that stuff. Because so the magazines were around. Oh, the, yeah. Back then, the magazines were around. Yeah, like, th they're always around. And yeah. so, you know, that becomes just like it. Now it's like you say, it goes into your hard drive. Yeah. Blemishes your mind. Now what's yeah. next? Now you want to kind of look into all this stuff yourself. And so me and my girlfriend at that time, I was 14. She was 14. We were only a couple years apart, a couple months apart. Um, we started having sex at that time. Um, and I remember um, before you know it, it just become common. Um, when she was, when we were 15 years old, she became pregnant. Dang. And um, I don't, I haven't told a lot of people this, but some people that really know, she, she was pregnant. And I didn't, I mean, I was a kid. I didn't know yeah. what was going to take place, you know. I didn't even know um, what my future was going to hold. I wasn't even thinking that way. Um, but a couple weeks after that, I remember I got a call from her and she was crying. Um, and she ended up having a miscarriage at her house. Um, and then at that time, you know, her parents weren't walking with the Lord or anything. So their, her parents put her on birth control. Because she knew they knew that she was going to be ha having sex, and this just became our lifestyle. Me and that girl, you know, we were together for four years, all the way through high school. We had a great relationship for a while, and then we had a very toxic relationship. Mm -hmm. The toxic relationship where, like, somebody's going to die kind of relationship. Yeah. Like, yeah. we would just be at it, like, and it became really bad. Abusive in a lot of ways, verbally abusive, um, I brought out the worst of her as well. It's crazy because we're all cool this day. If I see her today, we're all yeah. good. But during that time, because that's what happens with people. You start experiment, experimenting sexually at a very young age. You're dealing with emotions that you're not set to deal with. Yeah. And so when you start doing each other wrong, like we, we both did, both of us cheated on each other. Um, for me, I'm living a lifestyle that she doesn't even know. Like, she wasn't doing drugs. I'm doing drugs. I'm living this party life, and but I still want my girlfriend. I still want to do things on my my role, and I'm going to go hang out with my homies and do whatever I'm going mm -hmm. to do. Um, but, yeah, that relationship got toxic. So let's let's talk. If you've just turned in, I got uh, live with uh, – this is live with Ryan Reese. I have Sean McKean in studio, and uh, he's the co-host here, and we're just – we're wrapping through his whole story. Uh, we have, He's been on here for a couple years, and we still have never went through the details – but here you are, you're in this toxic relationship, Sean, mm -hmm. and this is around high school. Let's, let's talk about high school a little bit because yep. that's when things started getting wild for you. For me, the first time I ever smoked weed was um, with my homie Carlos. It was right after school one day. There was this guy that he, uh, these apartments he lived in, and he said, hey, come over to my buddy's house. We're going to go hang out. And I remember they were smoking a joint. I didn't even know what a joint was at that time. And then I began getting high. And before you know it, I was doing it like after school just about every day. I remember like driving home to my house and I was high, riding my bike home high. And just like the feeling of being high at your home with your parents and your brother. I remember just having like some trippy days. Um, but before you know it, it just became a, a way of life for me. Um, I was smoking a lot. Um, and then when you start getting high, then other people that around school, you start connecting. Oh, you get high too? I get high. Because you meet him in a circle. Yeah. <laughs> and so then after school became um, and now, that so was now in this, high all the time. So now in this environment, basically what happens is you just get around all these dudes, the, all these other dudes that are piling, piling out, and then the whole your whole life changes. Yeah. For you know, there's a couple things that happen. So when I was a, a sophomore in high school, 
getting high, kind of getting in trouble. I did something real stupid. Tell us about that story. I was uh, in PE class with a couple guys being a morons, and I was destroying teachers' cars. I was breaking them with rocks, like smashing windshields, like horrible. Did it another day in a row, and then that next day, all of a sudden, all the security from the, the school they saw came you guys? out of the— Yeah, they had been camping out inside the all the vans and all the cars— so when you're, th- I'm smoking cigarettes and wait, pee, hold on, like- hold on. wait. So you guys, because obviously <laughs> I know the story, but yeah. for the audience, so you guys are, did you guys just get done getting high? I don't remember. So wait, why, okay, so what made you think? Let's get rocks and let's throw rocks at all the teachers' cars in the parking. I don't know. I have no idea. It was a little bit of the baseball. How, in how, me. how many guys were there? Four of us. Four of you guys. Four of us. And, and you, got, I, you, guys were, you guys were at school throwing the rocks. Yeah, we were like we were the basketball courts were at Benita High School. And all the cars got totally— All the cars, and they're all the teachers' cars. And I'm just throwing rocks. I mean, like, 100 feet in the air, shh, just, and then just dropping. So just what cheering. happened? They, these guys jump out like they're the SWAT team. The SWAT team. I'm smoking you. a cigarette. I'm smoking at a cigarette. school? Yeah, throwing rocks. <laughs> Stupid. And then I just get r- ransacked. They come over me. They, they drag us out of there. And take us to the principal. I got strict probation. Uh, we were suspended, obviously, I believe, for like a few days, 10 days or something like that. Then I got put on this probation where I had to, like, clean uh, after school every day with, like, the maintenance guys who I actually got along with. Um, but Did a you little get in trouble with the law, the actual law? Uh, the, school? The, the cops were brought in. Yeah. It became uh, definitely a lawsuit that took place. All of the parents had to pay money. I mean, it was thousands oh of dollars God. worth yeah, of bet. damage. I bet. Um, and so between the four families, that we all had to pay, or our parents had to pay. So, yeah. And your dad could have killed you right oh, then. My, that was my it. Parents. That would have been it. I drove my parents That's enough crazy. to kill you. Um, and so after that, then in a high, in a sophomore year, I was on strict probation. The new principal was there at the school. And I just... Uh, he did something to me. Then he started to pick on me. And so I just, I, I had a hard time with authority. Yeah. And this guy tripped on me. I was in his office. He said he was going to keep, uh, he took one of my beanies and he said that he was going to keep it for the rest of the year. It was like January. I'm like, what are you talking about the rest of the year? And I went off on him. I cussed him out. I said horrible things. I throw over his the, the chair in his office, make a big old scene. You know what's funny about that though? What? When I was r- walking out of the office, there was another kid waiting to see the principal. And it was Gerardo Navarro. One that, of our best that's, friends. Yeah, that's one of our close friends. And that's where he's like, who is this crazy white guy? Like, just like losing it right now in the secret <laughs> principal's office. You're crazy. This guy's crazy. <laughs> um, I got to hang out with him. <laughs> and then I was, susp- I was expelled at that time. And then I started going to independent study. Um, and independent study for somebody that's doing drugs is, uh, you're doing a, drugs every rap. day. You know, Beastie Boys are one of our favorite bands growing up. And... They had a song, I don't forget what the, the title is, but one of the lines was smoking and drinking on a Tuesday night. Mm-hmm. Like, and that was truly our lives. Like, we were getting high, we were doing drugs on Monday, on Tuesday, Wednesday. Every, we it, used to say, every was, night of the week is a weekend. It, yeah. And, you know, at that time, too, a lot of us got kicked out. You started going to that sa- same mm-hmm. thing, too. Um, and so probably about eight of our close friends all were on this independent study thing. And now... Um, our drug intake started to expand, like so smoking weed. I remember the first time I ever did meth back in the day. Because you didn't have to wake up for school anymore. Oh, I didn't have to go to school. I only had to go to school like for an hour, uh, once, one, a week. once a week. And then, yeah, um, I did meth when I was a sophomore too. A buddy said I was struggling with um, having to read this book. And uh, meth is probably one of the most deceptive drugs that are out there. Yes. A lot of people battle with it. A lot of construction workers battle with it. A lot of smart people battle with it because their mind uh, won't shut off. It was something that... Um, and extremely addictive. Very addictive. First time I ever did it, I got all. Of, I did all of my homework in one night, and I got all the answers right for the first time in my life. I'm like, oh, man, this stuff's amazing. And then that was something that I started doing meth for a while. Um, and then obviously for us, the big thing that hit our high school was LSD, mm-hmm. um, or, and, you know, doing LSD and, and LSD drink. LSD was huge with us. Yeah. And then drinking, drinking and nitrous oxide, you know, all, all this stuff that we're talking about, like, you know, me and Ryan, when Ryan even tells his testimony, you know, there's only so much you can say, mm-hmm. but if you could truly understand, like. The path of our lives, the the evilness and the the darkness that we were um, around all the time, it was gnarly. Um, I almost died when I was 17 years old 
me and my, back in the day, in high school, we used to throw big old parties. Mm -hmm. And at all those parties were, were a bunch of drinking and also nitrous oxide. Mm -hmm. And nitrous oxide or Freon or whatever, it's where you huff it and basically you get these wah-wahs and then eventually you pass out. And like you would giggle or whatever and it was something that we did all the time. There was a place that we could go behind this building and we would fill up black trash bags filled with it. And we, we went to our buddy's house and it was myself, John Barry, Curtis, a couple of the guys. And we were hanging out in the jacuzzi and we were all getting high off of it. And all I know is that, um, I'll tell from their perspective because I didn't know what was taking place. Right. You pass out. And once everybody passed out and now are coming to, they said that they looked for me and they couldn't find me. And they were looking around. Then you guys were in the jacuzzi. We were in the jacuzzi. Sitting in the jacuzzi. Sitting in the jacuzzi. Nitrous oxide. Huffing ni nitrous oxide. Horrible idea. Nobody, <laughs> horrible idea. Nobody could find me. And then Curtis looked down and I was submerged underwater in the jacuzzi. Curtis grabs me, pulls me out, pumps my chest, gives me CPR. I All I know, I woke up and I threw up water. Like oh I felt like gosh. my chest was going to explode. Oh I mean like power gosh. of water coming out of my out of my mouth. I was 17 years old. Oh I could have died. Oh my goodness. I could have had major, major damage, but it's like, not even that stopped me. I'm just hanging out with my friends. Oh, that was crazy. You know, kind of mentality and moved <sighs> on. I never told my parents. I didn't want to freak them out back in the day. I think I told, they heard that story later on. But, um, those were some of the things that were common, you know? And then, even and, when we were younger. And then, and then what, go ahead. So, I mean, even when we were younger, there were guys that were at that time, um, we're already committing suicide. Yes. There was already overdoses of some of our friends we yes. knew. Yep. But we didn't really care. Nope. Didn't really care. Like we were rocking out. I felt like we, I, I had a mentality like we knew better than other people. Like I didn't want to be like in the system. Like you're against school, you're against authority, you're against yes. the establishment. And we know better and we'll figure out life by ourselves. And there was no fear. There was no fear the way we lived our lives mm -mm. as well. And all that stuff is just all the deception from the enemy. You know what I'm saying? He blinds you to all that stuff. That's the whole goal. If the enemy, Satan, can blind us to think that it's all good and it's not going to happen to us, yeah. even though people are dropping dead around us and people are Dean and the whole thing, and we're almost dying. Yeah. You know, you, you've just said you fell asleep in a, or passed out from nitrous oxide in a jacuzzi, and then you come out of it and still not even thinking about it. That's what the enemy does. He, he deceives us so he could take our life. Yeah. So that's what it says. It says that enemy looks around the world. To look, he, see, he looks to see who he can um, devour. Yeah. He's like a roaring lion. So this is, uh, we're going to get back. You know, we have like one minute till the break. I'm going to uh -huh. plug a couple things. Yeah, go for it. But you've been listening to this, the testimony of Sean McKean. He's the co-host of this uh, Live with Ryan Reese show. And the best part is to come. Obviously, he's going to find Jesus soon. But we like to talk about all these things because, you know what, I, I was just actually out with one of my friends out in L.A. He, he does a lot of the electronic events, and he says there's a huge push on LSD right now. LSD has made a huge comeback again. I've heard that, too. LSD has made a huge comeback. Uh, Molly or Ecstasy, is it's been back. It, has, it hasn't gone anywhere. It just keeps growing. Mm -hmm. And then, obviously, we know that weed's legal now, and, you know, uh, they got fentanyl, and they got all these different— crazy pierced drugs that are going on with the youth. Mm -hmm. And if you just go on Instagram or social media, I mean, musicians and all different people are just pushing this stuff through For social sure. media. It is cool to use drugs. They're saying it. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I mean, and, and these kids are growing up, even if they're not doing it, they're just getting influenced by social media and what they're seeing. So these are just the times that we're living in. But the good thing is that God is powerful. He wants to reveal himself, and we're seeing thousands of kids come to the Lord. Yeah. And, and it doesn't matter what you're involved with. If you're, it doesn't matter what you're involved with. If you give your life to Jesus Christ, he will forgive you. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. He will fill you, and he will start transforming your life. He will take what you destroyed and bring it into that new life. So that's the life that we're going to be talking about tonight, yeah. what Sean's going to be talking about. So if you, uh, just a quick plug, we are going to the high schools, the Kill the Noise High School Tours. Contact us at thewhosoevers.com if you want us to come to your public middle school or high school. We are giving the gospel in the schools, and we are seeing, hunt, well, I guess we would say thousands of kids getting saved at this point. So we would love to come to your guys' school. So contact us, ASAP. We will be back right after the break. 
More live with Ryan Reese coming up. Is everything all right? Sure. Call now, 1-888-564-6173. Or post your questions using the hashtag LiveRyanReese on his Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Uh, I think I speak for the entire administration when I say... Now, back to live with Ryan Reese. Don't say it when I warn you. Loud noises! All right, we are back, and we are in studio with Sean McKeon, the co host of this show tonight, live with Ryan Reese. Actually, you've been here for two years. Yeah, gone by fast. And let me tell you a little bit about what Sean McKeon. This has been one of my best friends since for 23 years. Mm-hmm. We've been through everything together. Now, here we are. Doing a radio show together, which is super sick. <laughs> but before the break, Sean, you were talking about how you were just growing up and um, in a good family, but uh, you had some issues with school because you were you grew up sick. You were in and out of the hospital, so it kind of set you behind. So you started hanging out with the knuckleheads in school, the the jokesters, and then um, getting into a relationship at a young age with a girl, fourteen years old. Started sleeping with her, went through like a miscarriage, got her pregnant at fifteen, and uh, just even exposed yourself to the whole like sex and porn when you were younger and then got introduced to drugs and alcohol and and in high school and, and here we are and you almost died in the in the jacuzzi mm-hmm. you were doing nitrous oxide with a bunch of friends in the jacuzzi and they were looking for you when they came out of it and you were at the bottom and one of our friends went down pulled you out of the bottom of the jacuzzi gave you mouth to mouth pumped your chest and you came back out of it which, which is crazy is in it's crazy to even think about i know that's insanity yeah and especially that curtis is the one that saved you <laughs> i know I know, Dude, it's crazy. that is crazy. Yep. So anyway, my mind's blown, again, to hear this story. But, so listen, so now here you are, you, you had that near, near-death experience, and that didn't stop you. You kept continuing to party. And yeah. one story, one last story I want to talk, yeah, that you, I'd like you to talk about, is because we were talking about how the enemy deceives us mm-hmm. when, we're, when we're in this lifestyle, and he blinds our eyes so that, to even think that we'd even get in trouble or die or anything like that. You ran into a lot of uh, issues with the law and stuff like that, but also you had a bad experience on LSD one night. Oh, yeah. And yeah, you- I remember that because that's when our drug intake was starting to, you know, I liked it. I remember the first couple of times I did LSD, I liked it. I said I wanted to feel this way forever. All of us were battling with a lot of stuff, you know. Um, and again, we came from good families, so did Ryan. Um, and I remember during this time, this is when they, they shipped you or you went to Chile for a little bit. 
Uh, they they talked me into going to Chile. Yeah, but I guess it was a shipping technique. Yeah, they they shipped you out over there, <laughs> get you out of your crew, and so you're gone. One of my close homies, and then it was John, and it was a couple people. But some of our other set of friends are starting to get into some real evil stuff. Crystal meth, crystal meth, pentagrams. demonic stuff. Yes, and you know I'm just like I want to party, and I'm gonna drop LSD, and you drop LSD at a home where all these people are like devil worshiping music yeah. they're into like very evil stuff yes and when you drop acid it's a it's a high that lasts eight ten hours there's no coming back at that moment you have to roll with it and the, what takes place like the mind-altering stuff that you go through there's some people that don't come back me and ryan have lost friends who have lost their minds being yeah. on drugs yes. and still to this day to lsd are, are not themselves i had a bad trip a bad trip so bad because I was in this home where there was all this evilness. I felt like I was seeing demons. Um, I thought that I was going to die. I thought I did die. Um, there was a part where I thought I was being buried alive. I mean, there's a lot of, if you've never done it, you, you won't completely understand. But the what took place, I thought I was losing my mind. Uh, John Barry showed up. I remember John Barry, who's a close friend of mine, um, was able to talk to me. And it kind of brought me back down to reality a little bit. Um, but yeah, and then imagine, like that was only my third or fifth time doing it, but I continued doing it after that as well. Continued doing it. So now what, what happened after this? So things are getting pretty dark yeah. in our lives. We're losing some friends. Um, but then it kept getting worse because then, I mean, I know crystal meth got really, really extremely big in your life yeah. and, and drinking. Yeah, so how was that whole grind? Let me try to overview everything we just talked yeah. about right now, just from that point on to like closer to when I come to the Lord. Yeah. So um, LSD, your parents are trying to deal with you and your addiction and you know, sending you off. My parents are, I'm driving them crazy. Um, a lot of our other friends, they don't all have the good families that we have to. So they're just kind of out for themselves. Um, for me, we went through two stints of uh, methamphetamines. I battled with it from 17 to 20 years old. You were with me as well. Mm -hmm. Me and Ryan would be so strung out, we would look at each other, our faces would look like skeletons, and we would have to eat before we went home because we will not want our families tripping on us. Um, and we would try to get sober. I would try to get sober. Um, and eventually we did stop doing meth for a little bit um, and then do our 20s. My relationship ended toxic. Uh, she cheated on me. I cheated on her. I didn't know how to deal with those emotions. My heart was ripped out. And so in the midst of my drug addiction, I had thoughts of suicide because of that. It didn't stick a long time, but there was emotions that I couldn't deal with. I couldn't figure out. So it was something that went through my mind. But instead, what I did is I dove myself more and just to the party life. I had my crew with me. My crew had my back, all my close friends. So I was able to move on from that relationship um, and then just started through our 20. And you were dealing with the same thing mm -hmm. with your girlfriend that you talk about mm -hmm. at that time that you were going to marry. And then you went into a circa and traveling and all that kind of stuff. I joined and, myself with alcohol. Yeah. And, and then drugs. during our 20s, is that's what it kind of, kind of took place. Mm -hmm. We were drinking a lot, right? We were going Every to clubs. Night. We were going to parties. We were just doing a lot of cocaine. And before you know it, our 20s are gone. We're in our mid-20s now. You're traveling all around the world. I'm working. And through the midst of all this, I've, I always worked hard. I always was yeah. doing construction. I, I was always trying to provide for myself. But now doing coke, doing the party life, you know, having all this crew of friends and like we ha we ran with a big crew ever since we were younger. Right. Mm -hmm. When we would go out back in high school, we would go deep. And even through our 20s, we had a deep crew. There was always fights that took place. There was always gnarly deep things. Deep as in like 40 to 50 deep. Yeah, we're not kidding. <laughs> not exaggerating. Everywhere we went. Yes. So. In that time, I remember about 25 years old, somebody gave me meth again, and this time it hooked me. Like it was different, it was powerful. I remember this like it was yesterday. We were kicking it at this house party. One of our friends was at a hotel, and he was inviting a couple of the guys over to come party and do meth, and they were like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not gonna go. And I'm like, do y'all go? I'm like, you guys are a bunch of drug addicts. Like, I'm just gonna go party, and I met up with them. Wouldn't you know that after that time I met up with them, Meth got its teeth in me hard. Like I would run out and then I would have to go meet up with him. And before you know it, I'm just trying to maintain this, this, this life, you know, trying to keep balance. And now you're in your 20s, 26. I'm strung out on meth. Then what comes with meth? A lot of perversion, 
uh, pornography in my life became a, a major thing. I was had girlfriends. All, I usually always had a girlfriend all the way through my 20s and stuff like that. So sexually, all that stuff was there. But the pornography, like I was, it was, my mind had gotten so perverted, so dark. I was getting in very dark relationships. And not knowing it at that time, I was opening myself up for the demonic realm that was tormenting me. Mm -hmm. And so when I was 26 years old, 25 years old, I got my first UI driving under the influence. I blew a .19, which is like very drunk. I was almost home. I was pulled over. I was arrested. My parents had to come pick me up. I remember going to those alcohol classes and they said, if you don't stop drinking, there's a 75% chance you'll get your second DUI. I'm like, yeah, right. Eight months later, I got my second DUI. But on this DUI, when the cop came up to my window, he threw me off. I thought he was going to say, how much you been drinking? He looked at me. He's like, when was the last time you had something to eat? And, you know, my eyes are blue. You know how dilated my pupils yes. would get. So I look probably pretty crazy. Yes. When he pulled me over, I was arrested. And now these are serious charges. Controlled substance. I had actually two bags of meth in me that could be looked at as distribution, even no though if it way. was a little bit. Yeah. Um, the cop was tripping on me. I'm having to call my brother in the middle of the night to come bail me out. There was like a $10,000, $12,000 um, um, to get me out. But then a bail bond comes like $1,200, something like that. So um, my brother bailed me out of jail in the middle of the night. And then I'm just in it. And now in two months, I'm going to go see my, my, um, the, 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 the judge. And get my sentencing. And this was a time in my life that was the darkest, man. And I remember it was about Thanksgiving, Christmas time. I didn't want my parents to know everything that was taking place in my life. I was going through depression, but even in the midst of it, I'm still doing drugs. I'm still getting high. I'm still hooking up with my girlfriend. Because that's all we know how to do. That's all you know how to do at this point. Just you know, and a couple things I left out because there's just so much, yeah. you know, in the midst of this, I got another girl pregnant when I was, when I was about 25 in the midst of this thing, I was a mess. I was messed up on methamphetamines. She, she, she liked me a lot. She said she loved me. I was so detached emotionally. Yeah. I, I was, wasn't on that level. And so that led her to go get an abortion. And she got an abortion during that time. And I feel like from that moment on, everything kind of raked up a little bit higher. Like, I, I just felt, like, uneasy a lot. I felt um, like I was battling, like, an anxiety. Like, I wouldn't even think of those things, but that's what I was battling with. Um, and I remember going through that time before the judge, like, I was so nervous because I didn't know what I was going to face. I had done a lot of stupid stuff when I was younger, 18, that I left out here, that now you're kind of building a record in the court system. It's not good. And so when I stood before the judge and he saw all my my charges, like I was definitely looking at jail like time. Like you're progressing. Yeah, I'm definitely looking at jail time. And then I started thinking, like, I'm gonna be like, I'm gonna be like cattle in a jail cell. Like, that shouldn't be my life. I remember yeah. seeing my full name, Sean Patrick McKeon, on court papers, and it's like, you're going to jail. I'm like, this shouldn't it can't be my life. And so, long story short. I didn't go to jail, but I got three years probation, a very strict probation, 18-month alcohol class, all this stuff. Wait, were you able to drive? Uh, suspended license from like a, a drug was... program and back and work and back. Got it. And so it's suppressing. And if you sneeze wrong, you're going to jail. Yeah. So my, my mentality was like, they're setting me up for failure. And this is the moment in my life where things began to change. John Barry, we brought him up a couple times, but... John Barry gave his life to the Lord, him and his wife at that time. And I remember him calling me on a Tuesday night and was looking for Gerardo's number because they were going to start a uh, Bible study and they wanted to invite Gerardo. He wasn't even inviting me at the time. He was trying to get Gerardo because Gerardo was battling with heroin, mm -hmm. uh, one of our close friends. And then he invited me. I'm like, um, no, John, I'm good. And like, I, I don't really like Bible study. I mean, why would I go to Bible study? Hung up the phone. I was at Chongo and, and Manny. And I was like, it was John Barry. He said, like, he's starting some Bible study. He's like, John Barry, Bible study? He's like, he's Indian, right? So he's like, oh, he's probably like, he's probably smoking peyote, yeah, some exactly. kind of weird kind of thing. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. That night, went to the club, went to a bar, blacked out, woke up the next morning. I'm in Laverne, the city I grew up in. I'm at McDonald's. And do you ever get that feeling like somebody's looking at you? Um, it, you know, in a room, and I look over, and it was your mom. It was Sharon. No wait, 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 wait. You're in the parking lot? I was at McDonald's, like, trying to sober up the oh, next day. Oh, in the day. morning, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I see your mom, like, oh, man, I got to go say hi to her. You know, I feel all hungover. And I walk over there, and as I get closer to the table, your dad was hidden, but he was there. I'm like, oh, my <laughs> gosh. Hey, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And then he was making small talk with us. Uh, that time, I remember you were traveling. You were out of the country. 
And so it was small talk or whatever, but I left. But this is what that did in my life. It made me say, maybe I will go to that Bible study. You know, I ran into Rawl. Um, he's always been cool to us. Um, never judges. You've always talked about that. And I ended up um, going to the Bible study with John. But, dude, it was a bunch of stoners trying to do a Bible study. It was Where, a was mess. Was everyone smoking weed? Uh, no, they weren't smoking weed, but it was so <laughs> unorganized. A bunch of food and not much Bible study, you know. Got but it. it was a spark. I went to go see The Passion of the Christ, a movie at this time, because that's what they all were going to see. That movie changed my life. So you're not a Christian at this point, but you went to go to see The, the Passion of the Christ in the theater. Yeah, I'm starting to read a little bit. Right, picked up a Bible. I picked up this little Bible study stuff, tripping. I'm, I'm going through this time of like, I'm probably going to go to jail because I'm going to have a run-in with a cop. I just know it. And I felt kind of self-destructive at the time. Um but this is where everything really began to change in my life. I saw that movie, and then I'm like, where does it speak about this in the Bible? And I called my mom, and then I began reading Matthew and John, and then boom, for about a month span, as I, after I read the Gospels, I said, what's the Bible all about? And I went to the book of Genesis, and I started reading Genesis. In about a month span, I read Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus in about a month. And then I remember as time went on, my mom says, like, and I was having this battle. I had my close friends that were wanting to go out and party and drink, but I had this desire to come home and kind of read. It was like a weird thing, you know? That's dope. And um, then my mom says, you should go meet, meet up with Raw. you know, maybe go talk to Raw. I'm like, oh, what, what am I going to say? I don't want to talk to him. One day it opened up that I was able to drive out to Golden Springs and I drove there and I remember like, walking in, I first I went to the bookstore because I was, nah, you know what, I'll get his number from Brian and I'll call him. But something, now I know, is the Holy Spirit right. led me to go to the front and that, desk. And that's something that was giving you a desire to read, obviously, was the Holy Spirit. The Holy working. Spirit working in my life. And then I come into the front office, and I'm like, hey, um, is Raul here? My name's Sean. I'm one of Ryan's friends. And this is what I'll never forget. This, I always remember it because it brings conviction to my life this day when I get really busy with life. Um, as busy as your dad was, and it was a Wednesday afternoon, he was down like in 30 seconds. And me and him went in the back room, sat down. I was like, look, Ron, you know, we battle with drugs. I'm jacked up. I've got my second DUI. My life's a mess. I don't know what's up. I'm confused. I've been reading the Bible. I believe there's a God, but I don't know what's up. And he just began to weep, and he began to cry. And he would say, we've been praying for you guys for so long. And we love you guys. And he asked me if I have a Bible. And I go, yeah, I got this one. He's like, hey, you need a better one. <laughs> and so he, <laughs> he took me to the, the bookstore. He gave me two bags full of books. He's a little. He just wanted an excuse to give you a bunch of books <laughs> and the new Bible. <laughs> he gets all excited. You need this one and this one and this one and this one. And so he gave me all these books. And I leave there thinking to myself, the last time I read a book all the way through was like James and the Giant Peach, like in third grade. Like, what am I going to do with all these books, you know? But I went home and I watched, you know, everybody knows this movie, Fury to Freedom, but they also did this autobiography where he kind of tells his life story. And this day, it just hit me hard. And so I came home. I, I said, you know what? I'm going to go to church that night. I go to church, April 7, 2004, um, Raul is teaching. I just saw The Passion of the Christ, a movie. He's talking about Matthew chapter 27, when Pilate has Barabbas and Jesus on one side, and he says, you know, at this time of year, I can release one of the prisoners. You can choose Jesus or Barabbas. The crowd chose Barabbas. They chose the thief. They chose the murderer. They literally chose the world. And I remember the, the Lord through your dad, by the power of the Holy Spirit, says this. If you don't know the Lord, that is a question that God is asking you this night. But I want you to pause it. I want you to think about it. Because, because what Pilate says is, what do you want me to do with Jesus to call the Christ? And that's where Raul says, that, that question, that answer to that question determines your eternal destiny. What are you going to do with Jesus? And at that moment, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, this is legit. This is genuine. I've been reading the Bible. Jesus is real. Um, the gospel is real. And that night I gave my life to the Lord. And my life, and I tell people this a lot because... I don't know where you find yourself right now in life. You might think that there's no possible way your life can change. I came to the Lord in complete disarray. My life sucked. I had three years probation. I had so many things against me. I had money was going out like water. You abortions. Know? Yeah, abortions, you know, addiction. And I left there thinking like, even the, before I knew the verse, it's going to be all right. If God is for me, who can be against me? I had that mentality. I drove home. You might not remember this, but I drove home. I called my brother, 
I called a, this girl that I was talking to at that time. I called you and I called X. And I remember talking to you in particular. You were somewhere. And I was like, hey, man, I'm like, I want to go talk to your dad today, blah, blah, blah. Like, I'm done. Like, I'm done with this life. And I remember you said to me, like, dude, I got your back 110%. Like, go do that. Like, you, you need to do that right now. Uh, like, I still got things I'm figuring out or whatever. And I'm like, I just knew. Like, nobody could tell me different. Like, yeah. if I didn't make this change in my life, I would eventually die or be in a prison cell. There's no doubt about it. 100%. And from that moment, I gave my life to the Lord. I began reading, I became plugged in at the church, and God started changing my life dramatically. All of our friends are tripping out. Um, and by that, after a while, about a year, your dad asked me to come on staff, and I didn't even know that a church needed a staff. Um, and I would, um, I just wanted to know the word. And so I would clean, mop, paint, whatever, and then I would start reading and listening to Chuck Smith and growing in understanding of the of the word. And God started changing my life. I remember going to your house when we we go out drinking and stuff um, with with your brother and all of our other friends. You would be at home listening to Chuck Smith CDs, mm -hmm. just burning through it mm -hmm. because that's that's what will change your life. Yeah. I want to do a, a little plug right yeah. now for uh, the new app that just came yep. out. It's the word for today. You could download it for free. It's on the App Store. It's every study that Chuck Smith has done, yeah. in depth and everything. Yeah. Exactly the same Bible or the same studies that me and John Sean have been changed going through. my life. That will change your life. Download it. Change my life. Um, and then for me, you know, now let me just share with you like where I'm at now, what's taken place yeah. because it's been. I've been walking with the Lord now, going on 14 years. It seemed like it was yesterday when I went to go meet your dad at that moment. And your dad has had a major influence on my life. He's a, he's a pastor. He's a friend of mine. He is a great influence in my life. Um, and I never thought that God could use my life. Understand that everything I talked about today, I'm not just talking lip service. I was a horrible student. I was bad at academics. Like, I was a stoner of all stoners. You know, I would slur my words all the time, right? And I quote, <laughs> if, wait, what, what, did Chongo? what did Chongo say? If Sean could do that, go up and teach, God then is real. God is real. Yeah. Because Sean couldn't even talk before. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, going in a place where now it's just a new life. You talk about this all the time, Ryan. The Christian life isn't a boring life. Like, this is like Heck the no. essence of life. It's like this new life. Like, I don't have to get high no more. I've never done drugs or alcohol for the last 14 years of my life. Are you counting the days that you've been sober? I've never had. I made it through another weekend. I've never counted the days <laughs> because I've been so focused on what God has for me. Um, I remember sitting in studies and listening to your dad teach on Wednesday nights, and I just felt like this burning in my heart, like, I'm supposed to do that, or I'm supposed to know how to communicate the Bible to people, and I don't even know what that looked like. And then as time went on, Scott Salamet would throw me in the mix and throw me to do my uh, first Bible study, which I almost would never do again because I was so nervous. Um, and then your dad gave me a lot of opportunities as well, and as time went on, I began to understand the gifts that God has given to me. He has um, given me the gift of teaching and preaching. It is something that when I'm putting a Bible study together, when I'm communicating, it just flows. Like I don't, I've never had to strive for it. It's something that God ha has blessed me with. And I'm under good teaching. Chuck Smith, Raul Reese, like all of these, this kind of teaching that's been poured into my life. And I've always had a desire to know the word. So God radically changed my life. He gave me a call. And I just knew that all I wanted to do was serve him. And then by that, it's amazing what God does. He restores your life. I never thought I would be 40 or 50 years old. Here I am, 41 years old. Well, not only that, you also got married. Yeah, and, have and, kids. and that's what I was that. going to say right now, too. And then in, in just in January this last year, um, me and my wife just celebrated our 10-year wedding anniversary. And I have had the ability of all those messed up relationships I had back in the day. I was able to do things right with a woman who loves the Lord, who loves me. And then we have three children, Cohen, Jet, and Uriah. My wife's name is Nicole. I have an amazing family. We joke all the time. I know my wife had a tough night tonight because my boys are driving her crazy. Because they're savages. Because they're savages, <laughs> for sure. Um, but I would not trade it in for nothing. No way. I have the, 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 the ability to go out to teach and to preach and have my family there. I was teaching last night at W Live. My family comes with me. They're a part of my life as far as supporting me in my, my call. 
and in ministry. I've taught Bible school for seven years. I mean, again, like how would I? It's just a crazy to even think about. And then to see what God's done in, in Ryan's life as well. Guys, you don't even understand. Like I walked with the Lord for four years straight. Ryan was still deep out in the world. He's one of my close homies. I look at him as, as a brother to me, as family. And you're seeing him because his parents knew he was battling with stuff, but I knew the life. Mm-hmm. So when they say, like, oh, Ryan's messing over drugs, I know, like, no, actually, Ryan's in heroin. Like, Ryan's actually, like, not good. Like, he doesn't have any limits. He has credit cards. He can go wherever he wants to go and do whatever he wants to do. Everything was out of his exposure. Exposure, And I could see him dying. And so when God did that work in your life, that was definitely a miracle. And all of us would be praying for it. I always think about you coming to the Lord of like, you know, in the book of Acts where Peter was in jail and then he comes out and he's knocking, hey, let me in. And everybody had been praying for him all night. And then when he's there, they don't believe it. That was kind of like with you. Like people have been praying for you, your family, your parents, your grandparents. And yet when you were there, it's like, I can't believe he's here. And then to understand that now God takes our lives, these path, our paths that cross paths when we we're young punk kids trying to find our ways. And now God takes those lives, these paths, and brought us together where we do ministry and everything. We bounce off, the, bounce things off each other all the time. And now we're being able to do a radio show. Um, you are going to all these high schools speaking. Um, I teach you're the Bible. It's been amazing. You're teaching the Bible. You're doing. You're teaching Bible school. You're 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 doing a lot of different things. Just the fact that this is even happening is unreal. But you know what's so dope is that. This could happen for anybody. Yep. You know, it's, it's it's so if God can use a knucklehead like Sean McKeon and a knucklehead like me, God can do huge things with all of you guys that are listening right now. And with that, all the parents out there, never give up on your kids. Love them. Pray for them. We've been talking about this. Kids are facing many challenges this day, but nothing is, is nothing that the Lord can't overcome. And when God reveals himself to a man or a woman— um, it will change and tra- transform a life. We were in the depths of darkness. There were times that, and again, as time went on, and we're 41 years old, me and Ryan, there are tons of people that we know that have died of drug overdoses. I have done funerals of close friends of mine that have died of drug overdoses or suicides. The reality of it is, is Satan has come to seek, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come to give you life and that more abundantly. And when you open up the doors of your heart and ask Christ into your life, it begins a whole new life. It's not our willpower that we stop doing drugs. People used to say, how did he stop doing drugs? How did he stop sleeping around? Like, I never thought that way. No. Like, it's like an inward work that takes place in your heart. God starts changing your desires God's desires become your desires, and then he starts showing you the reason for which you were created for. A lot of times, drugs and alcohol, I say this all the time, it's just a vice. People have other vices. Ours are drugs and alcohol, perversion and everything. And by that, our lives were destroyed, but redeemed by Christ. Thank you, Sean. That story was epic. (laughs) Love you guys. We'll see you guys next week. It's on. Peace. This has been Live with Ryan Reese. To connect or find out more about Ryan, click on ryan-reese.com. Check us out next Saturday at 9 p.m. for Live with Ryan Reese.